Acts chapter 18 today. The book of Acts in the New Testament, chapter 18, verses 1 through 17 today. We continue in a series on learning to hear God speak. Um, so just what uh, has been mentioned a few times already here, that we have a God who not only knows the names of all the stars because he created them and upholds them and directs them, but knows your name. And that God would love us enough to be personal and very, very, very real in speaking into our lives. And so our goal is to be able to hear, learn how to recognize and hear God's voice, not just for an emotional or spiritual thrill, um, but so that we're changed from the inside out because this is God's goal for us. So uh, we're looking today at another way in which God speaks. And I think you'll see it as we read it here. Acts 18, 1 through 17, um, the context is that the Apostle Paul is on his, what we call his second missionary journey. So he's going from place to place um, as he's trying to establish new churches, new believers. Um, we see this in Acts 18. Remember, this is God's word, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Listen for the Holy Spirit of God to speak um, as we listen to his word. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own head, heads, I'm innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. And so Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. And just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, Settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. And so he drove them off. And then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatever. Let's take a moment to pray. God, we need you. We are dependent on you for life and breath and our very existence. And so we certainly need you, Father, to feed us the truth of your word. So by your Holy Spirit, our prayer is that you would get past um, our inabilities to hear you, our hard hearts, our, our dulled minds, all those things that make us separated from you, Father. We pray by your grace and your power that you would really move in this place today and speak to each one here, that we would know, that we would have confidence that we have heard from you. And God, we'll give you all the glory, all the credit in Jesus' name. 
Amen. <clears throat> so we've, in this series, what we've tried to do is um, kind of flesh out in these different places in the Bible the different ways in which God speaks. Um, so we affirm, the scriptures affirm this, that God does speak, that it's frustrating sometimes. We say, how come they hear God speak and I don't hear God speak? But we said throughout, this is a learning process. It's not just an instant gift that we're given, but that we tune our hearts and our minds to recognize the voice of God. I mean, really what, what Max was sharing, that ability to separate all the noise, all the voices in the world, and say, no, that sounds like my Heavenly Father. And when we're able to do that, that the power of God begins to work in our lives. So this is not just so I get a, a thrill out of it. Wow, God spoke to me. It's so that I have a changed life. Now, God is so good. He meets us where we're at, and he will speak in so many different ways. And so today we look at a particular way, and this one may seem a little odd to some of you. Maybe you've never felt like you've had God speak to you through one of these means that were mentioned today, but the means are dreams and visions. That God, in fact, will speak through dreams and through visions. Um, now, a lot of times, we, I think pretty much everybody can say, probably, most people have said, you've dreamt something at some time, right? Um, but then the key question is, what does the dream mean, right? You have a dream, but you're not always sure exactly what it means. It's sort of like the, the couple, uh, the married couple, the husband and wife, they're having breakfast in the morning, and the wife says, I had a dream last night. And he says, what, what was the dream? She said, I dreamed, and it was a vivid dream, she said. I dreamed that you gave me a huge and beautiful new diamond ring. What do you think it means, she said. And very slyly, he had a smile on his face, and he said, you're going to find out tonight. And sure enough, that evening, the husband gave his wife a book on how to interpret dreams. Not exactly what she was thinking. We want to know, well, I have the dream. Does it have a meaning to it? So what I want to do, and so I, I hope I don't lose you here at the beginning, but I want to do a really quick, brief kind of survey of Scripture to give you what I see the Scriptures teaching us about dreams and visions. Because here we have to say it at the beginning, not every dream and not every vision that you and I might have in our lives is from God. Okay, so here's how the scriptures will help us understand dreams. Some dreams that you and I will have are not God speaking to us, but are simply what we would think of as an overflow of what the mind's activity of the day is. So in other words, if your mind has been working hard all day long on some particular issue or multiple issues, in the evening our brains sometimes will continue to process and you end up with all manner of dreams. Ecclesiastes 5.3 says this, A dream comes when there are many cares, and many words mark the speech of a fool, which is basically saying there's just kind of this overload, and uh, it kind of spills over. Um, so you've all had some weird dreams, you know. I mean, everybody, everybody dream, everybody dream you were a piece of pepperoni and you couldn't get your legs unstuck from the cheese that were stuck. You know, I mean, those are kinds of things like, is God saying something out of that? Uh, no, he's not. I mean, I've, I've had dreams where when I was playing basketball still, I love basketball and I would play and usually we'd play in the evening. So we'd come home and I'd shower and we'd go to bed. And I had some vivid dreams of playing basketball where I, one dream, I grabbed a rebound and it was one of these really rough games because there's a lot of jostling. I grabbed the rebound and I snapped that rebound to my other hand like this. And I woke up instantly because I had actually taken my arm and slapped it down about three inches from my wife's face. And she never woke up, so she didn't even know this. But I knew if I had broken her nose, no matter what I said to you, I'm not sure you would have believed that I had a dream playing basketball. So some dreams are just kind of overflow of what's going on in your day. So don't assume everything has some kind of meaning from God in that way. Some dreams are not from God, but actually are an extension of what, not just what I'm thinking about, but what I want. Like I know my heart has desires it has desires, and sometimes those get extended out even into my dreams. 
So the Bible will talk about this in Jeremiah 23. I have heard what the prophets say, who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy, here's the key, the delusions of their own minds? Which is another way to say kind of what my desires are. But my desires don't always line up with God's desires. Sometimes our dreams are just what we want. Some dreams are actually the work of Satan, masquerading as an angel of light. So here's what the scriptures tell us about this. This is a really interesting passage, Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 4, tells us this. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place. Now, let me pause there for a second, because I would expect this sentence to kind of continue along the lines of, oh, that must be confirmation, because a sign or a wonder that they, they mentioned, that they talked about, came to be, that therefore, whatever they say about the dreams or the visions they have must be true, but that's not what the Word of God says. If the sign or wonder spoken of takes place and the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them. Here's the key. You must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart, with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere. And so even if you have a dream that you feel is confirmed by circumstances in life, oh, that must be then what God is saying. The scriptures say, well, what's the key? And I know I've said this so many times in the series, but I think it's so important to hear again. The only way that we really come to recognize God's voice in our lives is by the word of God. That I have to get this word of God so into my mind, so drenched in my heart, that it becomes easier and easier. We're never perfect at this, but easier and easier to say that sounds like the voice of God and that doesn't, even if there are signs and wonders accompanying it. And so Jeremiah 23, 28 says, let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, which is to say, what's the real value here? What's the thing that really feeds us is the Word of God. And so, the Bible's real clear that there are dreams and visions, but not all dreams and visions are from God. But don't miss this. So if you say, well, see, I can't really rely on it. The Bible makes it really clear God uses dreams and visions. And it happens from through early in the Bible throughout. So you get Jacob. Jacob dreams And in this dream, he sees a a stairway that goes to heaven. And on the stairway, there are angels descending and ascending. And he realizes after the dream that that's actually God speaking to him. And he says, wow, God's in this place. I never even knew it. But the dream becomes this moment of God speaking clearly in Jacob's life. Jacob has one of his sons, Joseph, who's a really famous dreamer, isn't he? Joseph, who, who dreams that, the, that these sheaves of grain, his brother's sheaves bow down to his, and the sun, moon, and stars bow down to his. But then he has the ability, God gives him the ability supernaturally to interpret dreams. He ends up in jail, and he's able to interpret the dream of the baker and the butler. And he says, this is what this means. And then he interprets the dreams of Pharaoh, but he makes it really clear. Hey, I don't interpret dreams. God is the one who interprets dreams. God is the one who's speaking in this case. Solomon has dreams. He has a dream. God says, what do you want? I'll give you anything you want. I want wisdom. And then God says, oh, I'm really pleased. But it happens in this dream. Gideon, I know this is kind of an obscure one, but if you ever read this, this is really funny to me. Judges chapter 7, Gideon has a dream of a big bagel that's rolling down the hill and it crushes a Midianite tent. Okay, it's not a bagel, but it's a big round barley loaf is what he says it is. He has this dream. 
He, he's, he's the commander, he's the leader of the Israelite army, and they're facing up against the Midianites, and he has a dream at night of this big loaf of bread rolling down a hill, and it crushes this Midianite tent, and he tells another soldier, and the soldier says, this has got to be God speaking to us that the victory is the Lord's. And it certainly was. It's confirmed. Daniel has dreams. He interprets the dreams of King Nebuchadnezzar. And then he has a whole series of visions in his book, that, the book of Daniel. You get to the New Testament and Joseph, the husband of Mary. God shows up in that time and he's giving angels, speaking through angels directly to people while they're awake. Zechariah, Mary, all of this is happening. Joseph, the, the husband of Mary, hears God speak almost exclusively, it seems, in dreams. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife in a dream. Oh, by the way, after the baby's born, you've got to go to Egypt because Herod's going to try to kill the baby in a dream. In another dream, it's safe to go back to Judea. In another dream, it's safe not to be in Judea but to go on to Galilee. Dream after dream for Joseph. God speaks in dreams and visions, and the book of Acts confirms it. Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter explains what is happening, the whole outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And even today, I'm still continually blown away to continue to hear, and this has been happening for years now, the testimonies, the true stories of Muslims who have come to Christ in areas where we can't get missionaries. It's not legal to get them there. We can't get people in to share the gospel. And what does God do through the Holy Spirit? He gives dreams to Muslims. And you see this repeated pattern. They say, how did you come to know Christ? Because Jesus the Messiah met me in a dream. I mean, I shared this one before. I love this particular one where a Muslim man who became a believer said, here's how it happened for me. He said, we we're very poor. We had very little food left in our house. And my wife had made up just a little bit of macaroni. It was the last we really had to eat. But someone came to our door, a neighbor came to our door. And in the Middle East, this is really, really important at hospitality. In the Middle East, you would never turn someone away. And he said, even though we had not enough for ourselves, even we invited this person in for dinner. And he says, as we're beginning to eat, this bowl of macaroni's on the table, and there's not enough for all of us, he said, but we're all taking just a little bit. And then he said, I noticed as we're eating that the bowl in the, on the table was not emptying. We were taking some out, but it wasn't getting empty. So we took some more out and some more, and he said, and the macaroni was like growing in the bowl. We, the more we took, the more it filled up. And he said, I... I rubbed my eyes because I thought maybe I couldn't see right. He said, I actually looked under the table because I thought maybe my wife was hiding macaroni under the table. He said, that wasn't the case. He said, so we finished the meal. He said, at night I was sleeping. And while I was sleeping, he said, a man came to me and he asked, do you know who multiplied the macaroni? I said, I don't know. And he said, I am Isa al-Masih, Jesus the Messiah. If you follow me, your life will be multiplied like the macaroni. What a beautiful dream, right? Here's the question. How do we know it's from Jesus? Does that sound like Jesus, the Jesus who says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it a abundantly overflowing that sounds just like jesus and so god speaks even today in dreams and visions now some of you may say what's the difference between a dream and a vision anyway as i look through the scriptures the primary difference that i see is one is you're awake a vision is you're awake a dream is you're asleep and you say well why would god speak to us while we're asleep you ever think about this could it be that god who's always speaking and we believe this, God is always speaking, can't get our attention except when we finally lay down. Like that's the only time where we've, we've stopped spinning in our wheels the whole time and God is so patient. Like I've said, we're going to miss some of the times God speaks and it's not fatal 
in the Christian life because we're not only saved by grace, we live by grace. So when I've missed what God says, is that just it? I've, I've missed it, I've blown it. But I believe God is so patient. He's so caring, he's so good that he says, look, you've been running crazy all day long. And finally, the one time that I got you where you're still and can know that I'm God is when you're asleep. And that God lovingly would whisper and speak to us in dreams and visions. Maybe because that's the only time that we're quiet. And maybe, because I do see this, in the Bible, dreams and visions seem to always happen at critical points in people's lives. Like when there's super high stress in someone's life, when they are facing life-threatening circumstances, when their whole lives are gonna hinge on something that's about to happen, it seems that in those moments you get these dreams from God, these visions from God, And could it be that God in his goodness says, I'm going to speak to you in your dark places. Not just, yes, in a literal sense when you're sleeping in the dark, but figuratively, spiritually, in the darkest moments of your life, that God says, you need to hear from me. And if it means coming in a dream or vision, then God will do it. So believe and trust that God speaks in these ways. Now, I say this, and I don't in any way expect or intend, because God does what God does, that this week is when you're going to have a dream or a vision, or you had one last week, and that's why you showed up today. It could be, but all I know is we listen in every imaginable form for God to speak, because that's what we see in the Scriptures. Now, I want to do, in Paul's vision here, real quickly, not just that he speaks in a vision. It's at night. But Paul seems to be awake because it's a vision, not a dream. But what he says, what he says. God does speak in dreams and visions, but what does he say? And in this case, I think it's something that will hit all of our hearts. Because the first thing that he does, I think, for Paul is that God speaks in this vision for his perseverance, for his encouragement to persevere and to keep on. Verse 9, Acts 18, 9 says, here's the vision, do not be afraid. Here's, here's God speaking to Paul. Don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Why would God tell Paul not to be afraid except that Paul is afraid? And don't for any, any means lift these guys up as superheroes as if they're no longer human. You say, well, Paul, he's used to this. He goes from town to town. He keeps getting booted out. They stone him. They reject him. They abuse him and all kinds of... Like, he's just used to this. Let me just tell you something. The strongest people that you see in your life, nobody, if they're a human being, gets used, used to being abused. Nobody gets used to being rejected. No, nobody's immune from the pain and the hurt and the fear that comes when not only do they not want to hear what I want to say, they actually are opposing me, actively coming against me. And Paul's afraid as he speaks in Corinth. Yes, people are coming to Jesus. Yes, people are responding, but there's a good many people who are not, and they're opposing him uh, almost violently. And God says to him, keep on speaking. Some of you think that's got to be Pastor Cliff's life verse because he preaches so long. He keeps saying, keep on speaking. And what he's trying to say is, I know it will feel like it's not doing any good, Paul. You're speaking, you're preaching the word, but they're not responding. In fact, they're opposing it. What's the point? What's the use? Paul, keep on speaking. The, The primary thing here seems to be that God is saying, I know you're afraid. Do not let your fear become the thing that dictates your next decision. Don't be afraid. Keep on. For Paul, it's speaking. Keep on speaking. I'm asking you this morning, what is God saying to you to keep on? What fear do you have that you're doing something right now and you're saying it's not working? Maybe it's in your marriage. And in your marriage, you're saying, we have struggled for so long, We have been to counseling. We've tried every imaginable. We've gone to marriage counseling or marriage conferences, and it's still a battle. It's still a struggle, and it feels like at some point you say, it's not working, and my fear is it's not going to work. That you would hear God say, I see that. I know that about you. I feel that with you. Don't be afraid. Keep on with that good work. 
Keep on when you think it's not going to work. When you're parenting and you're saying, I'm trying to set these godly boundaries, good godly boundaries for my kids, but man alive, it's like a war with them because every time I try to make the boundary, they want to cross the boundary. Every time I'm trying to say, I'm not doing this to to spite you, I'm doing it because I love you. They don't believe me, they fight me, and at some point you're saying, it's not doing any good and I'm afraid it's going to end really, really badly. What's the point? that you would hear God say, keep on with the parenting. It's not for naught. It's not for nothing. Keep on. I'm going to be with you. I am with you. Maybe it's the forgiving. You're trying to forgive somebody. How many of you know forgiveness is never like a one-time deal, right? Oh, I did it. I did that forgiveness thing. Gosh, I wish that were true. But all it takes is a memory today or tomorrow, and bam, Whoosh. here it comes again, here comes the hurt, here comes the anger, all over again, I'm right back in it. And at some point, when you continue to do that, and you say, Lord, help me to forgive as you've forgiven me. Lord, help me not to get bitter. Lord, help me not to get a hardened heart. But because it keeps coming back, at some point, you're afraid it's not working. This forgiveness thing sounds great, but it's not working. And it's time to give up, and God speaks. And he says, keep on forgiving keep on persevering don't give up on this when you feel like i know i'm supposed to read my bible i know i'm supposed to pray but i have zero and i mean zero feeling to do it i don't want to do it i have no desire to do it and you feel like what's the point i have read it and i got nothing out of it i have prayed and nothing came of it and then you hear god say i know you're afraid But keep on in my word. Keep on praying that God would speak this strong, strong word where we all feel at some point in some area like just quitting. And God says, keep on. I always think of this example. I'm sure I shared this before. Florence Chadwick, a swimmer. Back in the 1950s, she was the first woman to swim the English Channel, which I think is like 21, 22 miles, something like that. She decided to up the ante a little bit. In 1952, she wanted to swim from Catalina Island, which is off the coast of California, to the California coast, 26 miles. She got in the water. She got all prepared, and she's got boats that are going along with her try to keep her safe from sharks and all that thing. She's swimming, and she's swimming and swimming, but partway through the swim, this massive, this happens on the California coast, massive and really, really dense, thick fog settled over her. She's swimming in the fog. She's swimming through, she's swimming through. She reaches a point where she says to the boats, I can't go on. I I cannot do this. And they pull her out of the water. Florence Chadwick swam 25 and a half miles of the 26 miles. She was only a half a mile from the shore, but she couldn't see it because of the fog. And everybody recognized that moment. Man, you were so close. Why did you Why did you quit? Because when you can't see the end goal, and life gets that way, you just want to give up. But what if you had a voice that could say, I have the goal for you. It's secure. I can see it when you can't. You know, two or three months later, Florence Chadwick swam the same thing again, and the same kind of fog descended. She could not see, but she finished. And she said, the only reason I could finish is because she said, I just imagined. I could see the shoreline even when I couldn't see it. And that's what God does for us. I can't see who I'm going to become yet. God says, but I know who you're going to be. Look at my son. That's who you're going to become. So he speaks that, and he speaks encouragement that he's with us. Look how he does this in verse 10. I am with you. Like that ought to be enough. I got all these problems, God. Are you going to fix this circumstance? Are you going to change that person? Are you going to rearrange these circumstances in my life? And he says, I am with you. That's great. That's wonderful. But are you going to do these things? I am with you, and that will be enough. I am with you. And then he says, and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in the city. Now, I was actually going to end this text reading today at verse 11 because it kind of wraps up nicely. He has the vision, and then Paul stays for a year and a half. 
Then when you get to verses 12 through 17, it gets more complicated. In fact, if this were a sitcom, they would have ended it at verse 11 because everything wraps up in 30 minutes. You could have the worst problems in the world. You watch a sitcom. I know it. I've watched the Brady Bunch, and it wraps up in 30 minutes, whatever the problem is, right? Life is not like that, and that's what the Scriptures reflect. What happens? Now, he says, no one is going to attack and harm you. That's what God told Paul. Did you read verse 12? The Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. That is after God says, no one's going to attack and harm you. And then they unite in their attack on him in verse 12. What is happening, God? You just gave me this great vision. You just said I wouldn't be attacked. And now I know this sounds like fine print talk here. This is God saying, well, I never said they wouldn't attack you. I said they would not attack and harm you. And here's what you see in those verses 12 through 17. They unite in their attack. They bring him to the place of judgment, and they think this is it, curtains for Paul. We're going to stone him in judgment. We're going to bring him before, and this is going to all happen, and we're going to be rid of him. And God magnificently flips it. He flips it because there is harm that's done, but it's to the synagogue rulers, not to Paul. God takes the evil that was intended and does what? He works good out of it. Why? Because I'm with you. Not to pull you out of those things. I'm with you to go through it in such a way that you don't have to fear. Now, this is a picture of me (laughs) when I was in high school. All right. It was taken when I was in college. When I was in college, no. This guy's name is Ryan Kennelly. I've used this guy's name. He used to be, he used to be the record world, uh, world record holder for bench press. Uh, his record's been broken, by the way. He's not anymore. But he, he actually, this is mind boggling I can't get my head wrapped around this. He bench pressed 1,050 pounds. One thou- I, I can't get my head around that. He bench pressed 1,050 pounds. You know what's really interesting? He's married. His wife also lifts weights. She bench presses 400 pounds. They have a kid. I don't know him. I don't know anything about him. But I picture this. If Ryan and his wife are walking down the street and their kid is walking in between them and they're walking down the street, can you imagine if the kid is scared? Well, something might happen to me. I mean, you'd have to go up to him and say, are you crazy? Your, your parents can bench press a car. What are you worried about? You're walking down the street with two of the most powerful people in the world, and you would be worried? Why are you afraid? Doesn't it seem a little odd then? Because, see, our father, he doesn't just bench press 1,050 pounds. He holds the whole universe. Wouldn't it seem a little odd then for me to enter every day with an overriding fear? If I really know my father, why would I be afraid? Now, I'm still learning that. I'm not saying I don't get afraid. I'm saying when I come back to that reality, that truth, wait a second, when God says that he is with me, it's not just emotional support. It is actually the God of all the heavens, of all creation, who made all things, walking with me and saying, Nothing is going to happen to you today that I won't be with you. And yes, they might drag you before the judgment seat, but no matter what bad happens in this world, I have the power, I have the strength to take the worst possible thing and cause good out of it. And that that starts to change my heart a little bit. God, you speak that? That's what you're speaking into our lives? Yes. Yes. That's our God who loves us. And he doesn't just say, I will be with you. Notice that he also says to Paul, and I have many people in this city. I got a lot of people in this city. Now part of that is for Paul's mission. Paul usually would go from place to place, plan a church, and then he'd kind of move on. But here, he gives him the full mission. What's our full mission as a church? BFCC's mission and purpose is to make and grow disciples. Paul The other half of the mission, you're going to do that here in Corinth. i got a lot of people here, and they need to not only come to Christ, they have, they need to grow in Christ. You stay put for one of the longest tenures that he has, a year and a half at Corinth. And so Paul's mission is defined by this, but also his encouragement. 
And these people that you're going to minister to, here's the beautiful thing, they're going to minister right back at you. There's going to be this, this back and forth encouragement in the body. In the body of Christ, we experience the presence of God. Because some of you are lonely. It hurts. Because you're lonely. And you're like, I love the fact that God is with me. But you know what? There are many times it would be great to have a physical hug, to have a handshake, someone tangible, to know that God is with me. And he says, that's why I've got a lot of people here, Paul. Not just so that you can pour into them and teach them, but that you get my hug, you get my encouragement, that God, in fact, will work through his people. I know we do this imperfectly. We're supposed to love each other. And we fall short. And I don't say that lightly. We need to repent and acknowledge it and admit it. I blew it. I didn't love you like you deserve to be loved. I didn't love you the way that God wants to love you through me. And it happens both ways. We all, we just mess up. But keep on. Don't give up. Don't quit on the fact that God wants to love you through the body. Because we're all imperfect. But I tell you, there from time to time, the perfect love of God comes through you to me. And I pray from me to you that this becomes the body of Christ. This happened just last year on a Southwest Airlines flight. They were flying there at 30,000 feet. There's a young couple that's on the plane. What's their names? Dustin and Karen Moore. And they, they asked the flight attendant if she would help them. They had an eight-day-old baby, eight days. And they're flying, eight-day-old baby. Would you help us change her diaper? And they were real nervous, and, and the flight attendant said, sure, I, I would definitely help you, no problem. And she asked, can I just ask, though, why are you flying with such a small baby, eight days old? And they said, well, we're first-time parents. We just adopted her, and we don't know what we're doing, really but we're so excited to have her. And the flight attendant, oh, that's, that's fantastic. She said, let, let me help you here. And then she went and she talked to the rest of the flight crew. And they had this kind of impromptu, um, a kind of a, 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 baby, a baby shower on the plane at 30,000 feet. And granted, they got an awful lot of pretzels um, in this thing, but, <laughs> but they gathered whatever they could to encourage them. And then they took it one step further. And the flight attendant got on the intercom and she says, ladies and gentlemen, we have a really special um, guest on our flight today. Uh, we want you to know that we have an eight-day-old baby with us. And first time, and the only um, uh, first time parents that, that we have on here, and, and she introduced them, you know, and just said, you know, just want to encourage them. And what we're going to do is we're going to hand out pens and napkins. And if you feel inclined to, obviously you don't have to, but if you would like to write just a note of encouragement to this young couple with their new baby. And no kidding, just about everybody on that entire flight wrote a note of encouragement, perfect strangers to this couple. And the couple afterwards were so moved. They said for the entire crew of strangers to come together like that and to partake like that, to show us that kind of love and kindness, that meant everything to us. All I can say is when I saw that, of course it made me smile, it's a great story, but I thought, if perfect strangers can do that on a plane, surely God can do that among us. Surely God can take us with all of our flaws and work a beautiful connection of encouragement for one another. Where you hear God say, keep on, maybe in a dream or a vision, don't stop, don't quit, but you also hear it from your brothers and sisters right here. Hey, don't quit, don't give up. Don't give up on the body of Christ. God speaks, and he loves you, and he wants to love you through us. Let's pray.